Good morning, and what a beautiful day it is to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this 13th day of June. Let us recall the words of Jesus, who said, The kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed. It grows into a great plant with many branches. For all powerful God, in Jesus Christ, who turned death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, one God in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Before I begin with the reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark and the parable of the kingdom of God found in the mustard seed, let me just share with you a few thoughts as we move forward into this summertime. First, you'll notice we get to see Carly's full face this morning. That is because she's vaccinated, as we all are in this room right now, which of course begs the question, when can you come if you've been vaccinated? The session met in May, and at that time, some of the more movements of the CDC had yet to happen, and said, let's hold the course until September. This was thoughtful to keep us safe, for it's still a bit of a mystery and wonderment of what exactly happens for people getting sick, because people still are getting sick with the COVID-19 virus. But I also would share just a couple pragmatic points. First off, Carly was just a bit shocked a moment ago when we told her how much it's going to cost to fix the air conditioning in the church, which finally broke last year after five years of nursing it along. We have a bill, or I should say an estimate, to fix it for $85,000. Now, as God would have it, God provides, and we are receiving an estate gift, but the amount is yet to be determined, and we won't know probably till fall what that is. But holding that out, right now, we have no air conditioning, and it's a bit steamy in here this morning. Second thought is, I'm away most of August on family vacation, as I usually take, but a little more extended this year, having not had time off since last year, along with our staff, who are helpful right now, sitting in the balcony, waving fans on their faces, and sitting over here on the bench with a fan, cooling her down behind her, Mary Jim, who have not, who have not had a Sunday off, sometimes doing double duty to record things since last March. So 
We are, in fact, though we look buoyant this morning, I think I look a little bit buoyant, right? Um, we're a bit tired. So we're looking forward to a little break in August when we'll be pre-recording services. Having said all that, I am definitely looking forward to singing songs of joy and independence on July 4th, which we can celebrate in the backyard. You'll need to bring a chair or a blanket to sit on. We might have one or two out there, but not too many, and we'll partake of communion and song together, and that will be a delight, as well as the first Sunday in August. It still involves quite a bit to haul stuff out in the backyard and set up, so we note that too. Now, let me turn to more pastoral thoughts for your well-being and everyone's well-being. First, my heart goes out to Sheldon, Jim Curran's partner of 30 years. Jim Curran, as I announced a couple Sundays ago, died from pancreatic cancer in late May. There'll be visitation, this is what you want to note if you're listening, visitation on this Wednesday from 1 to 3 at Stark Funeral Home if you'd like to pay your respects. That again is Wednesday 1 to 3 at Stark Funeral Home on South Washington Street. In fact, I think it's like 300 South Washington Street because people come knock on our doors and we say we're on the North Washington, not South Washington, if you can follow all that. Well, let us turn now in our prayer of illumination. For gracious God, we do read your word with a sincerity of heart, and in doing so that you will meet us in that place in the power of the Spirit to inform us and shape us into the people you have birthed us to be. In Christ I pray. Amen. The Gospel of Mark starts with this wonderful verse. In the first chapter, at the first verse, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Turning now to the fourth chapter, we hear Jesus tell a parable of this good news. In the 26th verse, he says, The kingdom of God is as if, as is The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow, and he does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk and then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said... This is Jesus. With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The kingdom of God. Jesus points to it. In the Gospel of Matthew, that's what he speaks about the most, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God this inbreaking that Jesus represents as he walks upon the earth, the embodiment of the good news. Back in Pentecost, only a few weeks ago, we noted that the giving of the Spirit creates a community, a commonwealth of God. When Jesus departs, he says that seismic cosmic shifts are coming, and they're going to blow you away. The Gospel of Mark also says at the very beginning that the Spirit will come upon us and will change us from the inside out. God's answer is not just temporal in one time and place. God's answer is personal. God's answer to this kingdom is Jesus Christ who comes to give us life, who takes us not back to our past. Jesus also said in the Gospel of Luke, Remember Lot's wife. I'll leave you to find that one in your Bible back there in Genesis. Remember Lot's wife. Well, I can't hold out the answer for you. I have to say it. That's all he says, but what happens is Lot looked back. Lot's wife looked back to what she was losing and turned into a pillar 
assault. So Jesus warns us, remember Lot's wife, but look forward in life to make all things new, he promises, to bring all things in us to a fulfillment as a new creation with a holy new life in Christ. This is true for us as individuals, and it's true for our world, and it's true for us as the church. But we may have a hard time seeing it, like that mustard seed in the ground. For today we have this story of the kingdom in that most famous image. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom is like a seed in the ground, and it is God who makes it grow. Implanted in the ground, just like the Spirit of God in your heart. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Note that he also says that mustard tree, it becomes a bush eight to nine feet tall, has many branches. Jesus says, I dwell in you and you in me, like that seed in the ground or the Spirit in your heart. Here in Mark's telling of the gospel, for the first time, a parable is at the center of the story. Now, one function of all these parables is to explain why. If Satan had been defeated, as Jesus told us back in chapter 3, the strong man has been bound. If Satan has been defeated, why does the world seem so unredeemed? That, to me, is as contemporary a question as it was almost 2,100 years ago. The second purpose of parables is to confront us with the mystery of how God is at work. It lays the common, a simple seed, alongside the wondrous, the kingdom of God. My late friend, Bill Plaker, who preached my installation here a number of years ago, well, 21 to be exact, if we are to make the world a little more like God's reign, he says, then we must start acting and thinking differently. The parable pushes in the right direction, towards faith. The parable pushes us to see things a little bit differently. As every gardener knows, you plant the seed, water it, make things optimal for growth, and some take and some do not. The key transformation happens underground, beyond our observation and control. In our technological world, we struggle to accept this, but it is nonetheless true that it is a mystery. So it is, Mark says, with the reign of God, and so it is with faith. We live in a world divided between believers and unbelievers, full of tragedy and hatred. 2,000 years after the time of Jesus, it's hard to see clearly the beginnings of this reign of God. Yet Mark says these hidden transformations, this change from the inside out, from the ground up, is already happening. It's already occurring. More and more, though, this kingdom of God, in a survey of pastors recently at the end of the pandemic, seems small and shrinking. Now, in the past, I preached through First Peter's lessons about all this and talked about God's desire to see us grow in faith and action and how the concept of Christendom, the Christly kingdom on earth, more as an institution than maybe even a change of heart. Preachers have been preaching about that forever. But this Christendom, Christ and nation being one, has faded since it began with the conversion of Constantine in the year 450 A.D. How the church that used to be on the town square, I said, is now off the town square, off the grid even. So in thinking about this parable of the kingdom of God is a lot like that mustard seed. I want to share some kingdom news that we are now experiencing, though we don't always see it. The biggest shift in Christianity since the fourth century, Harvey Cox, now retired, writes, 
back when the Roman emperor became Constantine, became a Christian, and said all who want to work for the government of the Roman Empire should be a Christian. Well, that was a great recruitment for the church. If you want a job, join a church. I was told by some friends in seminary that's still true in some neighborhoods in North and South Carolina, but I now know 25 years later it's not even happening there. The shift consists, though, here it is simply put, in three massive changes. The resurgence of religion. I hope you heard that. The resurgence of religion. Religion, the media has told us, was supposed to have died out. Instead, its importance has increased and is increasing in the world and politics in both public and private life. If you doubt that, you can read Harvey's little 180-page book, and he'll tell you all about it. A surprising second trend is that fundamentalism is dying. Cox takes issue with the media's conclusion that the upsurge in the importance of religion is due to fundamentalism's continuing rise. Cox says no. Fundamentalism, which is only 100 years old, is a rearguard attempt to forestall the third change. You hear that? It's an attempt to stop the change that is happening which is a change in the nature of religion itself. Cox says that we are in the midst of a massive realignment, a shift, a realignment away from us seeing religion as a way of belief. If I get my belief in order, I get into God's heaven. Still in some ways true, it's not been eliminated at all. But it is a realignment, a turning, toward seeing religion as a way of life for us to live in the world God has made and created and to make a better world for all. From fundamentalist preachers, or I should say evangelical preachers, to the most liberal preacher you might have ever heard, they're actually all preaching this. It might start with a personal conversion, but then to be God's light where you are, or it might be institutional change, might be advocating for policies, but it is a movement, a way of life for us to make God's world better for all. Now, it's always been present throughout history in the church, that message. So it's really one of focus. For my musician friends, it's a fugue, and which theme is in the foreground and which theme recedes to the background. What we are is in the midst not of decline, but a shift. And we don't know, though, what is beneath the surface. And that makes some of us anxious, some of us worried, and some of us hopeful. Like that crew upon the Mayflower, the passengers and the ship headed to a new world as we creatively reappropriate the core practices of what it means to be a Christian. I'll be really straightforward here. I know I've usually been thought of to kind of ramble around the topic, but I'm going to land right on it now. These ancient disciplines, prayer, worship, hospitality, going forth and sharing the good news and word in action, forming your spirit so that you can see the seedling sprout and giving praise giving praise that you can see it happening where you are right now as the Lord leads you. It takes a lifetime to grow into who Christ calls you to be. Seeking to become more mature in Christ should be one of the goals of your life. We have so many gifts. Thanks to God and to the generations of saints in this church family, we have a wonderful heritage to live and to share. You see, God is not going to take us back to what was. God didn't say, Moses and all of Israel, listen. Listen to me. Now that we're on the same page here in the Sinai, now that we've all got it together, let's turn and go back to Egypt. No. 
God had something better in mind, and thankfully it's already happening beneath the surface and above. A long time ago, I baptized Heather Fenninger. She was the first person I ever baptized. I remember she was beautiful, only about three months old, slept in her mother's arms through the whole thing. She grew up through good times and hard times. She was a good student and became an accomplished violinist. She even composed the music she played. Some 15 years later, after that event, I had been here in Ypsilanti a number of years, her grandmother, Jane, sent me her statement of faith, which I found in my drawer as I looked through that file of keepsakes of good words sent to me over the years, which I like to pull out when I wonder, what are the seeds? I cannot see them. So I looked through that box in my desk, and I saw Jane's note there, handwritten, and she had sent along Heather's statement of faith, which she read to the church as she confirmed her baptismal vows. She wrote, I have discovered that believing in Jesus Christ should be incorporated into all aspects of my life. He will guide my daily actions, inspire me to do the right thing, enlighten me to discover how to aid people. I have many choices and decisions to make in life, but the most important decision of all is to accept Jesus in my life. Living the Jesus way is how I want to live the rest of my life, helping others, loving him, sharing the good news. I decided to accept Jesus as my savior I know that Jesus will guide me as I live my life. Those were her words. What were your words? I have heard so many similar statements of faith through my 21 years here, and it is always a delight, comfort, and hope. You know, it was just a little water. It was just a little baby. She was asleep. But the Spirit of God was not. All this time doing a new thing, a tiny seed of prayer and water and spirit and faith, a future blessing that continues to grow us as we, the church, follow Christ. And God says to me and to us, I all know all this change can be scary. But fear not, because I am in charge. I am in the change you are facing. In all this change, new things, good things are on the way. I, the Lord, am intentionally bringing them about, good things. Because when the kingdom is nigh, when the seed looks so tiny and the ground is so hard, God brings the rain and it begins to grow. So to me, Jesus says today, there is nothing to fear as you act justly and love tenderly and walk humbly with me. Yes, you got to learn some new dance steps, but I'm pretty good at dancing with the stars and the worlds and all of creation and even you. Learn from me. Abide in me. You'll be just fine. Amen. Lord of all hopefulness, Lord of all. 
Gracious Lord, hear our prayers this day. Wonderful and merciful God, we come to you with a humble heart. We pray that we may see the sprouting of your kingdom, but if it was not to be, help us to give faith where we cannot see. We pray to you knowing that you hear our prayers in the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We come close to you. We pray for your church where we can broadcast, webcast, talk about you in the streets and in the homes, on the phone or face to face, but many in the world cannot for those who are persecuted in China, in Burma, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Myanmar, and other places. We're simply sharing the good news about your wonderment, but for what many perceive as the threat that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we would pray and advocate for a new creation now. Dearest Lord, be with those who suffer. Suffer in faith or suffer disbelief, who tragedy has befallen them and they have fallen from faith and they do not have hope. They only see the end and struggle to see any future. May the breath of your spirit break upon the embers of their heart and ignite a flame of hope for those who are depressed or bereaved, for those who are addicted, for those who are in prison, for those who were hungry in food or for justice, for those who yearn to be back together. Help us to wait. Help us to embrace the hope that you have given us for that mustard seed which grows within we pray not just for ourselves, not just for our friends, but for our strangers that we will never meet, who we pass by as we drive along the roads, who stand behind us in line at the supermarket, and we do not know that they don't have enough to pay for what they need. For those of us we think of as foes, even enemies, Christ tells us to pray for our enemies, and we know it is not easy. I hesitate even to find the words. Hence, lest I might misspeak. But I know that your spirit guides our hearts. For those who once had enmity can be reconciled. As the rabbi and the clan worker in Oklahoma were. As the white supremacists and the advocate to overcome racism in Arkansas have. Help us to have ears to hear, and hearts that are open, and a firmness of conviction, of faith in you to hold us fast amidst the changes in the sea. Gracious Lord, our faith looks up to thee Hear our prayer. Help us live in your hope and therefore walk the gladsome path of light. Dearest Lord, we remember well our friend Jim Curran, a deacon with a gracious heart, a delightful sense of humor, who loved beauty and flowers and gardening or collectibles but was generous in sharing a good word of encouragement to all, along with a wry sense of bewilderment sometimes. But he had hope in you since the days of his youth. Lord, hear our prayer. May we be your church, as indeed we are. In Christ I pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You're invited to join us at 11 o'clock on Zoom this morning to chat and say hello. As I leave you with this good word, that we go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. God has a purpose in our being there. Christ, who dwells in us, has something he wants to do through us, where we are right now. Believe this. Go forth in the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.